Network monthly webinar, and we will be starting in a couple minutes, so I just wanted to make sure you knew you were at the right place. Thank you. Welcome to the California Improvement Network Network's uh, monthly webinar. This is um, our monthly webinar where we're going to talk about the patient-centered medical home, learning from national initiatives. Um, this is Sophia Chang from the California Improvement Network speaking, and we have um, the honor today to be hearing from Dr. Ed Wagner. But let me go through a little bit of uh, kind of logistics and etiquette before we get started. We will be recording this session, and so we'll also be providing at the end of this the URL where the, where the actual slides and the recording will be posted. Sometimes people ask whether or not they'll be able to have the slides available to them, and they will be available. Um, to reduce distractions, we ask that you try to send your calls to voicemail, silence your ringers, close your other applications, and please don't put the phone on hold. Given that we have a fair number of callers today, I think we will probably go ahead and mute everyone, but we are going to provide some opportunities for people to ask questions directly, and so all of these rules still hold or actually are more important when we do unmute folks. To ask a question, uh, if you've got any logistic issues, please feel free to chat, and that's the bottom right corner on, uh, of your, should be on the bottom right corner of your screen. You, um, at the very, very bottom, you type in your note and you can send it to the host and she can help you um, with any logistic issues. If you have questions to the speakers, you can either chat to all or given that we see a fair number of people with phones next to their names, you can click the little hand button, which you see probably under the list of participants or over the chat uh, box and uh, we can unmute your line and you can pose your question in, in, in person. Um, and we hope that that will be the main set of, um, of rules, if you will, to help you guide through this. We're going to also try a voting function in a few moments, but I'll explain that when we actually get to it. So as I mentioned, today's speaker is Dr. Ed Wagner who is a general internist and epidemiologist and director emeritus of the McCall Center for Healthcare Innovation at the Group Health Research Institute in Seattle. His research and quality improvement work focus on improving the care of individuals with chronic illness and cancer. He and his McCall Institute colleagues developed the infamous chronic care model, which is an integral part of the patient-centered medical home model and they are involved in multiple efforts to use these models to improve ambulatory care nationally and internationally. So it's really a real honor and pleasure to be able to have him speak with us today. He's written two books and 300 peer-reviewed publications. He's an elected member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies. Dr. Wagner was the recipient of the 2007 NCQA Health Quality Award and 2000 Picker Institute Award for Excellence in Patient Care, and the 2011 William B. Graham Prize for the Health Services Research. And in spite of all those great accolades, he's still a really wonderful man. So, what we're going to do today is something a little bit different. And so, I'm going to ask Canal if you can bring up the poll. You all should see on the bottom right part of your screen right now a little polling uh, series of three polling questions. And if I could ask you to go ahead and give us a little bit information about what kind of healthcare setting you're coming from, whether or not you're currently participating in any, in any patient medical home initiatives, and what your job function is, go ahead and click on the appropriate boxes, please, and hit submit and we'll be able to get a, just a better tally and sense of who is in the audience today. And while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and put an apology out because I realized, and so I can tell some people are actually reading our webmail blasts, that in the announcement for the call today, uh, we had mentioned that Dr. Wagner is very heavily involved in two different safety net uh, initiatives. One, the Safety Net Medical Home Initiative, which we're going to hear a fair amount about. And he's also involved in the FQHC Advanced Primary Care Practice, I can't even read my handwriting here, um, demonstration program. 
And we had said that these were programs that California clinics are not involved in. That is incorrect. They have not, they were not involved in the first initiative. There are numerous clinics that are involved in the second one. So um, I guess the good news is that someone was reading this closely and I did get the feedback that we were incorrect. And I'm hoping, Canel, can you tell how many people have voted? Uh, yes, we still have a few in progress. Okay. So we'll let that come up, and what I'm going to do in the meantime is uh, move this over and move the ball to Dr. Wagner so that um, once we uh, go through who we have in the audience, he'll be ready to speak and able to um, give us a little bit more background. The other thing that we're going to do that's a little bit different in this webinar is Dr. Wagner's comments are actually going to be pretty brief. And then we're really going to try to have a little bit more of a dialogue about the experiences in these patient-centered medical home initiatives and really want to make this um, a more interactive style session. So I will start off with um, a couple of leading questions and my profound hope is that folks will feel free to either send their message in the chat box or raise their hand and pose the question directly to Dr. Wagner. He's really full of an incredible amount of knowledge and, and information that we'd love to, to all learn from. Ed, are you on the line? I am. And can you um, click onto your slide set? There you go. So, Canal, do we still have votes in progress or can we pull up that tally? I'm going to pull it up now. Thank you. So, it's kind of like, ooh. <laughs> Countdown. So we should all see in a moment the actual results of the poll if we have troubleshot this technology correctly. So, <laughs> I'm not seeing it yet. <laughs> How about now? Uh, it's not coming up for me. Is it coming up for you, Ed? No, I still see the questions. Okay. Well, why don't we get started, and we'll let Canel try to troubleshoot this, and maybe we can get the tally at the end of your comments. How does that sound? That sounds good. Well, thank you, Sophia, and, and, and it's nice to be with all of you. Um, I don't have to tell this audience uh, why this is such uh, an intriguing topic uh, at this point in American history. Uh, a lot in the Affordable Care Act talks about the importance of a robust primary care sector um, as the foundation of a high quality, low cost, uh, um, effective care system. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the general consensus now is that the route to a robust primary care sector is transformation to the patient-centered medical home. And what I'd like to do in the next 10, 15 minutes is quickly sort of tell you how we're, we have been approaching it in a couple of different projects that Sophia mentioned uh, where we are trying to help uh, federally funded and look-alike community health centers and other safety net practices uh, make that transformation to a patient-centered medical home. Obviously, uh, there are challenges, uh, major, major challenges in this, in this effort. Uh, first of all, what is a patient-centered medical home? Uh, there were lots of different sort of formulations, but if we were going to work with busy pra <clears throat> practices, we clearly needed a crisp definition and a clear sort of recipe for making uh, the changes associated with transformation. 
Second was it has become clear over the years uh, in working with the chronic care model and other efforts uh, to make major system changes uh, in practice uh, that there are organizations that just are not ready or not capable of making those changes. And, uh, and I think increasingly there's interest in trying to figure out how to identify those practices early in the process before they and whoever is sponsoring the initiative spends a lot of time, energy, and money uh, on what might be a fruitless enterprise. Third, how do you measure progress? Uh, how do you know whether a practice is actually changing itself uh, and making the transformation? Uh, and then what kind of support seems to help practices make the transformation? Uh, and then how long does all this take? These were the kinds of questions we were wrestling with in, in planning these initiatives. So let me briefly tell you about the, 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 the first one, the Safety Net Medical Home Initiative. Uh, it is funded primarily by the Commonwealth Fund, but also by local uh, philanthropies uh, in uh, some of the states that are involved, which you'll see in a minute. It's been a, a five-year initiative to help 65 uh, safety net organizations in five different states make the transformation uh, to, uh, the, to the patient-centered medical home. Uh, we are leading this project in collaboration with our colleagues at Qualys Health, which is Washington State's uh, quality improvement organization. Uh, as I say, there are five states that are involved, and as Sophia said, California is not involved, uh, but it's Oregon, Idaho, Colorado, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts, very different uh, uh, environments uh, in, which, uh, in which to uh, try to work uh, with the practices and the stakeholders like Medicaid uh, that uh, play such an important role in either incentivizing or de-incentivizing uh, transformation. Our uh, general approach to providing technical assistance is, is a train-the-trainer model. What we've done is identified lead organizations in each of the five states. Those organizations are, are really responsible for the uh, interaction with the sites in their state, with coaching those sites, with uh, making, helping uh, develop and implement a measurement program and so on. Uh, the, uh, there are learning collaboratives both nationally and then of course locally. And there's more emphasis on, on what's going on locally, meaning within a state, than across the states, although there's lots of shared learning going on. The lead organizations are mostly uh, um, primary care associations, the Massachusetts League, the Oregon Primary Care Association, uh, Co the Colorado Community Health Network is also a primary care association, as is Idaho. Uh, the one exception is the Pittsburgh Regional Health Initiative, which is a well-known uh, local uh, multi-stakeholder alliance that has been devoted to improving particularly hospital care, but has gotten interested in uh, ambulatory care of late. Uh, we needed for this project and then for everything we've done since, uh, a, as I said earlier, a clear uh, definition of what a medical home is and then what are the, the kinds of characteristics and then the changes related to developing those characteristics that constitute a medical home. 
What we did was we reviewed the literature, our own experience in, in quality improvement, talked to a lot of people, and then assembled uh, a, a draft set of what we call change concepts. And I don't know whether you're familiar with the term. It's really a kind of an IHI term to describe the general uh, changes that one needs to make to a health system to uh, improve a particular aspect of care uh, and, uh, and achieve uh, a certain goal or outcome. A change concept is not, is not a, an explicit, uh, detailed recipe for, uh, for implementation of a change. It's really a general framework in which it's expected the local organization would uh, create the specific changes uh, that were uh, consistent with the culture and the infrastructure of their particular system. Uh, and then the change concepts as a group, we call a change package, again, more IHI. Jargon. So that was our goal with these national experts. We locked them in a room in Denver, and we closed the windows, and we uh, and we went at it for essentially a full day. And then on the next slide is what uh, is what emerged. That these are the characteristics of a, a patient-centered medical home. A patient-centered medical home has engaged leadership. And what we mean here is leadership that active, is actively involved in, supportive of, uh, of quality, of continuous quality improvement. And not only talks the talk, but walks the walk in, in the sense of providing the time for busy staff and the resources to enable uh, their staff to make the changes. So that's engaged leadership. Uh, it has turned out in all of our work to be the, the one absolutely essential change. Without in, engaged leadership, practice transformation has proven to be almost impossible. Second is a quality improvement strategy. And here we mean that the practice has in place an infrastructure and a set of processes that enable it to make changes while it's continuing to see its patients and do its business. A quality improvement strategy means that it has an approach, whether it's lean or the model for improvement, um, that, uh, that the staff understand that approach and have embraced it, uh, that it has a measurement system in place so that it can track uh, uh, its performance over time to see whether it is in fact changing. Third is this terrible word, empanelment. Um, and the, the, the critical word in, is embedded in that word, which is panel. We want we want clear linkages between provider and patient because patient-centered medical home is heavily based on the notion of a, uh, uh, of a central provider-patient relationship uh, and con continuity of care uh, for that relationship. Empanelment is simply the process of assuring that those linkages are explicit, are part of the way the practice organizes itself and its data, and so on. Fourth is, is the, is, is the re-emphasis on this notion of continuity of care, which is one of, the one of the most powerful characteristics of a practice in terms of what predicts uh, performance. Continuity of care has been associated in study after study after study with better patient outcomes, better patient experience, better provider experience, and lower cost, uh, better coordinated care. 
So it, it is absolutely essential. Empanelment is, uh, is, is the administrative step to getting there. But continuity in, in the modern era needs to be with more than just a single provider. There's now a overwhelming evidence that the involvement of a full practice team in an organized way in the care of patients leads to better outcomes. So that's why this change concept is called continuous team-based healing relationships. Fifth is patient-centered interactions. And, and of course, this is essentially uh, uh, assuring that the, that the adjective patient-centered has some meaning uh, in patient-centered medical home. And here we're talking about the changes associated with assuring that patients get high-quality self-management support, decision support, that they are encouraged to actively participate in their care and in their decision making, and that, uh, and that this is embedded in, in what the practice measures, uh, as well as uh, the way in which uh, it interacts with patients. Organized evidence-based care is essentially <clears throat> the rubric that captures uh, those other elements of the chronic care model uh, associated with, with planned care, population management, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, those aspects that have, that have been now well established to lead to better outcomes, not just with chronic illness, but with other illnesses and preventive care as well. Care coordination is, um, is a term that uh, you, we used to understand, but in recent parlance, it's become equated with, uh, with nurse care management, uh, and people are, uh, have been, I think, overlooking the fact that large percentages of the practice uh, cross boundaries to specialists, to community services, they go to the hospital, they go to the emergency room. Care coordination uh, pertains to all of those uh, times uh, when patients need or, or are receive services outside the practice. The lack of care coordination, care fragmentation, um, has, has now, uh, we're begin, beginning to understand uh, the implications of fragmented care in terms of high cost, um, poor patient experience, and increasingly poor patient outcomes. So care coordination is a critical element of a patient-centered medical home. And then finally is enhanced access. And here we, we, we're referring both to the accessibility of visits uh, within the practice uh, during the practice day, such as same-day appointments for those that uh, want or need them, uh, as well as out-of-hours access. So these are, these, these are the change concepts. Under each of these uh, are several more specific change ideas, um, and this is essentially the agenda. Uh, for our transformation efforts. What are we trying to achieve? Uh, what we're trying to achieve is, is benchmark performance in quality, efficiency, patient, and, and patient experience. Uh, and there is a focus both on the, on the quality of care for patients, their experience. A critical element of all of this is the experience of staff. Um, one of the major reasons that uh, American primary care may not be as robust as it might be has been uh, the increasing discouragement of primary care providers as, amplif as amp uh, exemplified uh, by, by uh, the dramatic reduction in medical students choosing primary care careers. 
So making primary care uh, an enjoyable, rewarding career choice uh, has to be a goal of these transformation efforts. And then, of course, in the population served by the safety net, reducing disparities continues to be a critical agenda item. How does a practice become a, a patient-centered medical home? Uh, it is, it, well, I, I'm trying to find the right adjective. It's just plain hard work. Why is it so hard? It's hard because um, practice routines and culture need to be turned upside down, uh, and that's painful. People find their roles changing, find that the relationships among people within the clinic uh, change. Uh, over time, generally, that the experience has been that those changes are, uh, are, have been uh, rewarding, uh, but while undergoing the change, it, has been, it, it is unsettling uh, and, uh, and, and um, disruptive. So what helps? Uh, what I think we have found over now 15, 20 years of organized ambulatory quality improvement is that being part of a learning community like a collaborative helps. It's certainly not a cure-all, uh, but it helps. Growing evidence suggests that having access to a practice coach or facilitator uh, it really does help. Uh, and increasingly what we're seeing, and uh, our, our Safety Net Medical Home Initiative is, is an example of what we're, we're calling hybrid quality improvement efforts, uh, which combine learning communities like a collaborative with practice coaching. The regular, I can't emphasize enough the importance of the regular measurement of progress and the delivery uh, of useful, timely feedback. And then uh, we're finding that having an array of tools and, uh, and case studies uh, uh, based on, on, on previous experience by similar practices is really helpful. What we've done in the Safety Net Medical Home Initiative, and, and I encourage all of you to take a look at this, is, is try to uh, make all of these aids um, tangible and, uh, and in the public domain. So in support of that change package are a number of what we call implementation guides, which are, are hopefully practical uh, um, sort of uh, 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 recipes for uh, how others have made these changes. Uh, facilitator guides for that are uh, for coaches, um, and then uh, uh, special uh, topic uh, uh, summaries. Uh, all of these are available on, on the, uh, these these websites, um, and I'll uh, I hope you'll uh, you'll visit them. They're all in the public domain, so there's no worry about. Uh, needing permission for this or that, we want people to use them. And then, as Sophia said, I think our latest major initiative is uh, CMMI, the, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Innovation Center's uh, Advanced Primary Care Practice Demonstration. This is a three-year initiative. It involves 500 uh, FQA, federally qualified health center sites, 240 or 50 different uh, community health center organizations in 46 states. 70 of those 500 are in your state, are in California. The goal uh, of the initiative is that uh, is for at least 80% uh, of those 500 to achieve level three NCQA recognition 
uh, patient-centered medical home recognition. Uh, and the root is practice transformation using the SNMHI change concepts and materials. Some of the same characters, Qualys, McCall, are in, uh, along with the National Association of Community Health Centers uh, and the American Institute of Research are, are leading uh, the technical assistance. I'll, uh, that's, that's sort of where we are, and I'm going to turn the ball back to my friend and colleague, Dr. Chang. Sophia? Thank you. And what we're going to do now is, again, something a little bit different. I'm going to start a, um, a conversation with Dr. Wagner, and I really would like to encourage those of you in the audience to um, pose your questions. Either raise your hand with that little hand icon above the chat box if you've got a phone next to your name and I, we can unmute you and call on you. Or um, go ahead and, and pose your question in the chat box to all. But before we get started, I just thought it would be interesting. This is a little bit early on. We've had more dialer, uh, more callers dial in since we did this poll at the beginning. But just to get a sense of who's in the audience, you're pretty widely distributed across kind of public settings, medical group settings, uh, not as many from the hospital system, which makes sense in that we're talking more about ambulatory care systems and um, but also if there are a number of folks from the health plans and many of you consultants out there who are probably trying to help some of these practices transform. Uh, and also that about half of you at least are participating in uh, an FQHC transformation or collaborative or initiative. So I think that many of you may be very interested to hear a, li a little bit more about what this journey is really like and, and what some of those other lessons are that have been learned from um, other colleagues' experiences. So, um, um, and most of you are on the administrative side, which I think is, is interesting, and not many, as many of you seem to be on the, on the clinical side. But again, um, I suspect many of you are trying to figure out how do you actually help make these transformations happen, and or is this an area of, that you really want to pursue having seen that great slide where you see Sisyphus trying to push that boulder up that mountain uh, and knowing what kind of work uh, this kind of a transformation um, would mean. So given that, and given that we painted a slightly <laughs> negative, not a negative, but a, a hard work ahead picture for PCMH transformation, I wonder, Ed, if you could talk a little bit about Maybe a story of, of more of a, a standard clinics, uh, you know, one of the clinics in your collaboratives, what their success stories look like. Because I think we've heard a lot about these you know, very high uh, functioning clinics, and there are a handful of them that people have heard about. But we don't hear as much about the, you know, the more standard or Joe regular clinic and, and what, their, what their journey's been like. Yeah, I'd be I'd be I'd be happy to, um, because among the among the 65 sites in in the Safety Net Medical Home Initiative are are, are many community health centers that that um, you know outside of their local area nobody's heard of. Uh, they're not they're not the frequent uh, speakers at IHI conferences and so on. Um, and and what we're finding is that that their ability to make changes um, is no different uh, than than the superstars. They're starting a little bit further behind, but but where you are, the only thing about where you are currently that that really does matter is whether you have a stable uh, electronic medical record system. Having the critical element is the word stable. Even a stable um, paper record system enables change better than an unstable electronic medical record system. So, so the stability in information system is, is a critical element. But that said, 
the I think I think overwhelmingly whether it's uh, uh, whether it's a practice that is small and nobody's ever heard of or it's a big frequent attender at national meeting kind of place um, what makes the difference is this concept that have, has been identified by the transfer med evaluators called adaptive reserve an adaptive reserve is simply the capacity of the clinic to make change and it and it appears that there are really two or three components to adaptive reserve the biggest component is committed leadership and i could give you a nice example one of the stars of of our safety net medical home initiative is a community health center called Health West in Idaho. has a number of relatively small centers in small cities in, uh, uh, in uh, southern Idaho. Um, and their leadership just embraced this and went home and led it. Uh, and, and, we're, and we have seen dramatic improvements uh, in that practice, major shifts uh, toward uh, patient-centered medical home. So it's it's leadership, and then the other thing that's a critical element of uh, of adaptive reserve is is having a quality improvement uh, strategy and measurement system in place. Those those places that 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 are doing quality improvement. Their staff understand it, and it doesn't matter whether they're using lean or whatever, as long as they're, they have a they have a strategy and and it's and it's widely known and embraced. Those are the places that are making change, and we're seeing changes uh, uh, in in 50, 60 major change in 50 to 60 percent of uh, the practices that are involved, and it's not all the superstars. Which is heartening, you know, because I think this is, it, it is really hard. And, and people have been working, especially I think many of the people in our audience, have been trying to be the champions for quality improvement for many years in their organizations. And this is kind of the chance to really build on, on that basic capacity that's been uh, kind of nurtured over the years. There are a couple questions that I've got here from folks in the audience. One, and I don't have the answer to this, and I don't know if you do, Ed, was to ask if they, we know how many FQHCs in California um, are Joint Commission or NCQA Level 3 recognized. And I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. I, I don't know that. I do know that nationally among the 500, it was less than, uh, it was about, I think it was about 15 percent or something. So it's it's a very small it's a very small percentage, and I would assume it's no different in California. Right, and I think the uh, last time I looked for, in terms of the FQHC certification, and it was even lower levels uh, under NCQA. Um, the numbers in California actually were lower than the national numbers, but that the last time I think I looked at that was about a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, so if you want to look it up, actually, you can go to the NCQA website and, and, um, and look up, and they will list those who are certified, and you can see. Uh, unfortunately, you have to do a count <laughs> um, off the list. The other question that I have, I think, is, is, uh, is a little more intriguing uh, and I think a challenge for many. Um, and this is uh, Paul Maskovich, who is a psychiatry medical director in San Joaquin County, which is that Central Valley area. And um, they have several variations of PCMHs under development. And um, his real question is, is how do you bring primary care into the mental health arena? And what scope of services might you aim for? And how much of direct primary care can be delivered in the mental health arena? Uh, it seems that care management is probably a key component of what might be provided there. Uh, and how can the primary care services be reimbursed? Lots of questions in that one. Yeah, I. Oh, I do, I do. We've learned a lot about this by working with community health centers because they are clearly way ahead of the private medical sector. 
Um, almost all of the 65 that we're working with um, have made some effort at um, getting um, on-site, some sort of on-site uh, behavioral health uh, uh, competency, um, which of course you don't find very often in private medical, uh, uh, pri private primary care practice. Um, I think increasingly we're also seeing real, uh, real partnerships between community mental health centers and community health centers, um, such as that include things like sharing of staff. Um, in terms of, of, of reimbursement, uh, there is a real interest in, uh, in some of CMMI's uh, and work around Medicaid of, uh, of, of changing uh, uh, the way in which uh, reimbursement is handled for uh, conditions like, uh, like depression and follow-up of serious mental illness. So, so there, there are experiments going on uh, locally, and I think uh, I think there's a national demonstration uh, either that has just been launched or so. So I think uh, I think the, the safety net is where is is where a lot of the innovation uh, in uh, in behavioral health integration is going on. Uh, and we're all learning from it. And I also have to say that from some of our experience in dealing with some of the medical groups and um, in the commercial sector, especially in the Medicare Advantage arena, I think many um, of those who are managing some of these elder populations have been um, perhaps um, a bit more surprised by not only the number of, of um, depressed uh, beneficiaries or members that they have who are as part part of their population cohort, but I think even more surprised by the number of elders who are chronically mentally ill. So even though there are um, there are a fair number of um, innovations that are going on on the safety net side, I think increasingly as we're looking at um, more commercial style plans taking on the management of the dual eligibles, that this is going to quickly become an important area of learning for better models of care, um, kind of across across the board. I, the only other thing I, I, I would add is, um, is I, I think uh, we should all be looking very carefully at the DIAMOND project in the state of Minnesota. And, and, and just very briefly, it's based on now the well-studied collaborative care model in which primary care receives uh, uh, a, a, a sort of bundled payment for the, manage, for the care management of patients that are documented to have uh, depression. Um, and and so they have a designated trained care manager in the practice. It's that care manager started out as being a nurse because that's where that's what the uh, the research showed. But of course, many primary care practices uh, nowadays don't have registered nurses. So they began experimenting with could you train a licensed practical nurse or even a medical assistant to administer the PHQ-9 and, and, and do some of the telephone follow-up that has been shown to be uh, effective in, in, for example, the management of depression or bipolar disorder. And then also uh, provided funding for a behavioral health consultant, could be a psychiatrist, could be a psychologist. Uh, in some rural areas, it, it was a, uh, a mental health social worker um, who would support the practice and the care manager uh, and, and 
in the in in the collaborative care model. So they've got every payer in the state in in Minnesota agreeing to uh, support and fund this approach and uh, and the impacts in terms of of number of patients and percentages of patients who are uh, are really helped and see major reductions in their depressive symptoms is impressive. I think that's the kind of model I think we're all headed for. Oh, let's hope so. <laughs> so um, I have another question, which is, you know, you mentioned circling kind of back to some of the core requirements, if you will, or uh, necessities in order to be able to successfully take on the patient-centered medical home transformation. One obviously was the leadership. The second was the stability of whatever electronic health record system is in place. But I think that third part where we talk about not only having a common uh, language or management approach, but you know some common understanding vocabulary of how we talk about improvement. But I think the hard part is that measurement piece. And I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about how do you manage that balance between the hard part of making those day-to-day -day changes, how do you actually change the way you do things and how you practice, while you're all also trying to do this measurement side, which because of our culture, I would argue, it's not something we're used to doing as part of our clinical care. And um, and I guess maybe some thoughts about how people have taken on that challenge or, you know, what's any tidbits on what works? Well, I, I, I when you say measurement, I mean, I, I think there's really um, sort of two, two I'm, I'm sure there are more than two aspects to this. One, one is, is measurement of, of, of the performance of the, of, of the practice or the clinic. Um, and, and, and there, I mean, I think, I think what we've got to do is, is, is help practices um, make measurement uh, a routine uh, aspect of just the, the fundamental way they do business. And that means make, you know, don't buy an EMR that isn't going to help you uh, produce the kinds of measures that you want, um, for example. So, so there's, there's that base level of, of, of just practice performance measurement that, that if in place just makes transformation much easier. Then the mm -hmm. second kind of aspect of measurement that's that seems that is critical is measurement toward transformation. In other words, how how do you know that you're getting more and more like a medical home? Um, and 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 more usefully, where you're making progress and where in those eight change areas you're not making progress. And there are a variety of instruments now that are out there. Uh, we have our own that we developed for the Safety Net Medical Home Initiative, which is available on those websites for anybody that's interested, which is a practice self-assessment based on, on uh, the assessment of chronic illness care, the ACIC that some of you may be familiar with that we use for years. In, in seeing whether practices were implementing the medical home. Those are, are particularly, those kinds of measures are particularly helpful in, in really seeing the practices that are not moving uh, and, and have become a, a major support for those that are coaching or trying to support a practice. So you, the practices that have both of those kinds of measurement systems in place uh, are the ones that are successful. What's bothering me more than anything, Sophia, is now with now that most practices have EMRs, um, they they ought to be able to generate uh, uh, 
meaningful measures on a routine basis. The problem is we have so many different uh, uh, recommended measurement sets and so on that we're finding practices are confused. Um, they aren't measuring the same things. So uh, in putting together, for example, learning communities, it becomes very difficult. I, I, I wish we would. I wish we would just finally, once and for all, uh, say that we're going to have a standard measurement set for ambulatory care. Yeah. Here, I also see someone from California Quality Collaborative with their hand raised. Um, Canal, can you unmute them? Go ahead. Hey, Ed, it's Lance Lang. Uh, I take great pride in being one of your first guinea pigs on this stuff. Uh, hey, I read recently something that I think you contributed to the uh, Institutes for Alternative Futures uh, projection for 2025 and was pleased to see the concept of the uh, community-centered health home that goes beyond traditional medical measurements or, or interventions to think about the social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. Are, is any of your current work um, uh, in in what you've described here, moving that way, I think the the fam the uh, community health centers that you're working with would be perhaps among the most uh, uh, capable of of thinking in those terms. I I I think Lance, the honest answer is is uh, not explicitly uh, because the internal transformation is so hard. But, but clearly for those practices that have, have, have kind of been on this journey for a while and, and, have, and feel that they are getting close to where they want to be, uh, they are clearly moving in that direction of looking outside the practice uh, to make real the linkages, for example, with critical community resources, uh, uh, to, to see what role the practice can play in other fundamental human needs like education and so on. And, uh, and nutrition. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, Ed, I see another question here from Hunter Gatewood who asks, can you say a bit more about changes in reimbursement from health plans that seem the most promising to you? You mentioned the bundle payment as part of the ICSI Depression Care uh, Diamond Project, but are there are there other models that you've seen or heard of? Well, Hunter, as you as you well know, there I mean there are a host of models out there now that are that are being used in various demonstrations. Um, in in the most the, the most typical one is the one that that uh, CMMI is using in in the advanced practice uh, advanced primary care practice program, which is uh, simply a uh, per member per month payment uh, to to the practice, so that every participant in the APCP is receiving six dollars per month per member uh, per Medicare recipient per month uh, as as their incentive uh, to embark on the transformation journey. Um, and uh, I mean, what we're seeing is uh, is uh, mostly hybrids with some bundled or uh, capitated payment, uh, a certain amount of fee for service. And then uh, performance, a performance incentive, which used to be uh, a bonus, but is increasingly in the form of so-called shared savings. Um, so I am I am not aware of anything that of any one of these various mixtures of payments 
that seems to be more effective uh, than others. And so another question here from Rhonda Aubrey is, can you please discuss some of the most effective ways to engage leadership in FQHCs? Because I think she noted that you have engaged some of the clinic consortia. And she's wondering what kinds of strategies have worked for either the um, primary care uh, associations or consortia as they've wanted to engage leadership. Have you seen any um, good a examples or strategies? Well, there, there are now, um there are now a number of, of leadership uh, training activities, um, and uh, I, I think what we used to do in collaboratives is we would have um, a, a kind of informal senior leaders track uh, where they would chat with each other uh, and, and they would get pep talks from faculty and so on. I mean, I don't think we felt that that was terribly effective, although um, what did seem effective in some instances wa were uh, leaders that could hear from a peer uh, who had uh, uh, described how they turned their organization around. Right. I uh, so, think those kind of peer-to-peer -peer stories really seem to work. Absolutely, but I, but I mean, what we're going to be trying in the APCP is a little bit more um, across the board, or or least uh, on call um, leadership training uh, to support transformation, uh, which. Uh, now uh, several uh, organizations and people are, are doing. All right, here's an interesting question. Uh, and this, uh, it's very apropos things that are happening right now in health reform. This is from Andrea Rosen, who's overseeing plant selection for the California Health Benefit Exchange. And they're going to be selecting plants to be offered through the exchange early next year. She's wondering if you have any specific advice regarding how health insurance exchanges should evaluate a proposed qualified health plan's inclusion of patient-centered medical homes as part of the exchange's selection criteria. And should those criteria always include a pay-for-performance element? If so, are some payment approaches more effective than others? And what are other criteria which are key to look at as we select? That's a big loaded question. <laughs> Yeah, and I, and I I wasn't sure whether whether the the criteria pertained to the the uh, payment approach and benefit package or or to some, uh, some of the participating organizations. What can can we try to unmute Andrea here, Andrea Rosen? Canal, try. I'm wondering if we can ask Andrea to. Are you there, Andrea? Yes, I am. Okay. You want to clarify your question? Yeah, it's uh, it's not related to the benefits. Uh, the benefits are going to be set by uh, federal and state law. Those are the essential health benefits. So this, the question for the exchange is: plans are out, are out there contracting with various types of providers. Uh, to be part of what they propose um, to be sold through the exchange. And many of them are working with uh, patient-centered medical homes, accountable care organizations is another kind of uh, newer way of organizing the delivery of care. And we're just looking for uh, what kinds of criteria we should establish when a plan comes in and says, we have these patient-centered medical homes in our network, and this makes us better. How how should we evaluate what's good, better, and best? Yeah, uh, that, that's what I thought you were asking. Um, because I'm glad the other things I couldn't answer. This one, <laughs> at least I have an opinion. Um, uh, and, and the data on, on whether NCQA recognition uh, uh, really is associated with clinical performance is is mixed. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, many of you may be aware of the recent paper in Health Affairs from Los Angeles uh, that, that didn't seem to show any relationship uh, between NCQA recognition and, and diabetes performance. But there are other data that, uh, are, that, that, that have been uh, at least presented, if not pr published, that, that, that uh, suggests that NCQA recognition means something. Um, but I would, still, I would still like to see performance metrics. Uh, and and, and uh, the organ, I mean, and, and we know now that the way in which uh, um, medical homes reduce overall health care costs, at least so far in what's been published, is by reducing emergency room use and hospital and hospital use, readmissions, admissions. Um, and uh, I, would, I would certainly like to see data along those lines. Uh, to, okay. to show to show me that these are organizations that that are have really turned themselves around and and can really make a dent in quality and cost. Okay, those two metrics are the main metrics. Yeah, well, those are the, the, the those that's the route to to uh, cost reduction at the moment. I mean, right. other clinical metrics are fine. You know, and, uh, as uh, the outcome metrics like blood pressure levels and hemoglobin A1C levels and so on. Thank you. Do you have an opinion on the, can I ask one more question? Go for it. Do you have an opinion on uh, the use of Evaluate as a data collection tool and uh, the ability of patient-centered medical homes to respond uh, in that context? Um, I, I, I have an uninformed opinion. Uh, I mean, I have seen how it's worked in our community because uh, our uh, uh, Johnson-funded alliance uses it. Um, it does seem uh, to uh, uh, it, it does seem to have face validity in terms of the results. Um, I'm not aware of formal studies of it, but uh, uh, but I think it's worth a serious examination. Thank you. So we've got a little bit over our hour, but I want to thank everyone for their questions that they've posed because I think it frankly makes the, the conversation in the webinar a lot more interesting. And most especially, I want to thank uh, Dr. Wagner for his time and um, sharing his wisdom with us. And uh, just as a last parting shot here, just to give you the URL where the recording of today's webinar along with the slides will be posted within a week. And um, thank you, everyone. And especially thank you, Ed. I think this has been a great session. And we had a lot of callers stay till the very, very end. <laughs> My pleasure. Goodbye, everyone.